co-chair for the Chicago Southland Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I know many of you are disappointed. You're used to seeing Mike Schofield up here uh, with his great jokes uh, that he only shares with us. So I will apologize. Mike didn't send me any jokes. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to welcome us today to this uh, magnificent campus, I'd like to uh, turn the podium over uh, for a moment to Ms. Maureen Kelly to welcome us to Governor State. Good morning, and on behalf of Governor State University and our President Elaine Maiman, um, welcome to everyone. We're glad to have you here. Great to see such a wonderful crowd. Uh, President Maiman was on the um, agenda to speak today. Um, she was called to Decatur this morning to attend a bill signing with Governor Pritzker. Um, it was a very important piece of legislation that is going to um, provide uh, more opportunities for high school students to um, see what's available as far as financial aid on the federal and state level. So we're very excited about that opportunity and hopefully we'll see some more students at not only this university but uh, keep everybody in Illinois and at our community colleges. So we began classes in just a couple weeks. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary. So we're looking forward to many, many years uh, more of serving the community, our residents and students. And especially we would look forward to strengthening and creating new partnerships. We are very supportive of uh, the third airport and a lot of the work that's being done by this organization and others in the region. So again, on behalf of the university and President Maiman, thank you for being here and enjoy the program. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have uh, some of our regional legislators joining us today. And I'd like to invite them up to the podium and give them a, a few minutes to talk about some of the uh, exciting things that have happened in this last legislative session. Uh, we've seen legislation related to, uh, to gaming, cannabis, uh, a big capital bill, um, uh, revenue for transportation related projects and of course uh, the investment that's going to be made in the infrastructure for the airport also. Uh, I'd like to bring up and have them please uh, come to the podium in this order. Uh, Representative Anthony DeLuca, <coughs> Representative Debbie Myers-Martin, and uh, Leader Will Davis. Please join me in welcoming our representative. Hi, good morning, folks. Good morning. good morning. I thought we were doing a panel this morning, but so I didn't necessarily have a speech prepared. But I um, guess I'll give a, a little bit of information on the South Suburban Airport. Is that okay? Yeah. I didn't think there'd be too many objections to that. But uh, first, you know, I want to recognize Rick Bryant who, uh, I think it was right back here, right here, Rick Bryant. All through this legislative session, uh, I never thought I'd talk to Rick this much in my lifetime. And ever since adjournment, uh, we've been communicating on a regular basis as we continue to uh, move forward. Uh, and I also see my predecessors here, uh, Judge Scully. Good to see you, George. George was very helpful when I first took uh, the state rep seat after you vacated it. But you know what I did? I had not done this before. So I went online and I went to the Federal Aviation Administration website. You ever done that? Okay. I don't know if too many people would have done that. And I was happy to see that right at the top, South Suburban Airport. This is on the Federal Aviation Administration website. The state of Illinois continues to work on plans for the potential establishment of a proposed South Suburban Airport that will be located near Piatone based on FAA site approval granted in 2002. The state has been acquiring land to preserve the option of developing an inaugural airport. The state is focused on initial establishment of an inaugural airport with the capability to expand to accommodate accommodate future market demand. 
Uh, currently, the state is working on its master plan and has submitted a number of components of the plan. Once FAA receives all the components, the draft airport layout plan and master plan from the state it can determine a schedule for the completion of its environmental analysis. So I thought that was very good news to see that it's, it's out there in the, on the website. So a couple of things, a couple facts, because I'm asked a lot, you know, people hear there was money in the budget, money was in the capital bill. It was in the budget, just so everyone knows. It was not in the capital bill. Uh, if, if you think back to session, the last 10 days of session was extremely hectic. And there wasn't even certainty whether there would actually be a capital bill. That's how uncertain everything was. Things were moving, there was a lot of different discussion going on. So it is in the budget, and it was approved, the 162 million. And so you are aware of what that money is hopefully going to be used for, 12 million of it. The appropriation would be for the completion of a federal coordination, including FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, review of the IDOT, South Suburban Airport Master Plan, and preparation of the FAA Tier 2 Environmental Impact Statement and Record of Decision. The completion of the FAA SA, SSA Airspace Design, and the completion of the FAA SSA Airspace Procedures. So 12 million of that would be earmarked for that purpose. And the 150 million, 150 million of it, would be towards 50 million or so, approximately, for the new interchange at I-57 near Eagle Lake Road, 20 million for the intersection improvements at Illinois 50 and the airport entrance road, 30 million for local road improvements, and 50 million for enhanced utility corridor, electric, gas, water, sewer, IT. So there seems to be from when I'm out in the communities and I'm asked questions and I, I hear people's thoughts, they're not really sure about what the money is going to be used for. You know, some people think that that money is for building the airport. It's not for that. And that, that's important that everyone understands that uh, as we move forward. So, can I see if there's a question? Does anyone have any questions on that? I know we just have a few minutes each, but if there's a, a couple questions that maybe I can answer, I'd be happy to. Otherwise, uh, we will move on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative DeLuca. Next, uh, Representative Debbie Myers Martin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Very happy to be here. I've been involved with uh, the CSEDC for a very long time because I've always felt that economic development is one of our cornerstone, cornerstone priorities in the Southland. So, uh, but I'm also very happy to be here to talk about my session, which was wonderful. It was, it was so historic in the words of the governor and the speaker. Uh, we accomplished so much. We brought back so many dollars to the Southland. The Southland legislators really collaborated together to make sure that we had our place at the table uh, when the capital dollars were being handed out. And so I'm very proud of the work that we did in Springfield. Uh, I was one of the new kids on the block, and so I had a lot to learn. However, I will say that Representative DeLuca, Representative Davis were there every day to give me mentoring, to give me advice, to tell me where the back elevator is, and all of those things you need to know in Springfield. Uh, but moving bills, uh, moving them out of committee, getting them voted on, filing bills, co-sponsoring bills. I co-sponsored and chief co-sponsored over 100 bills. Bills that I felt would be germane, 
would be of value, would be beneficial to the Southland. I tried to work with the Illinois Municipal uh, League so that we were in concert with my mayors. I must say my mayors have been so supportive of me. We were on the phone talking about projects and talking about dollars. And so I am very, very proud to be the representative for the 38th District and to have been successful in our efforts to make sure that the Southland, the Southland region had a strong voice in Springfield. So my district office is in Madison and I welcome conversation because I want to make my office interactive. I want you to know what I do and what, what you need is what I want to know from you. So thank you so much, and again, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Rep. Myers Martin. Uh, and next, and in conclusion, I'd like to invite Major Davis to the podium. I'm state representative of the 30th district out here in the south suburbs. Um, as the mayor mentioned, I have the unique pleasure of being uh, part of the leadership structure in Springfield as an assistant majority leader here from the south suburbs, um, which gives me, I think, a unique opportunity to advocate and to discuss issues that are pertinent to our region. Uh, let me start by thanking Representative DeLuca, uh, particularly on his efforts with regard to moving the essential piece of the airport puzzle forward with regard to the interchange that he talked about, um, which we know is something that's necessary. So uh, can we say that we've had success as it relates to moving the agenda uh, items for the South Suburbs forward? Uh, of course I can say we have had success with that. Should we be satisfied with that success? Absolutely not. We know that there is truly much more that needs to be done uh, and many more conversations that need to be done. And before I begin, is there anybody here from the state of Illinois. Governor's office, state of Illinois. And the reason that I ask is that I just need you to make sure you quote me correctly. <laughs> when you go back. I had that problem once before and it got all twisted. And, you know, I just want to make sure uh, that, that, that that's the case. So, and, and the reason that I say that is because for those of us that attended the Chicago Southland uh, Chamber luncheon uh, the other week and we were pleased and honored to have the governor come and to speak to us at that, at that luncheon. Um, I think many of us, based on his comments relative to the airport, were not, that's not particularly impressed, to be quite honest with you. Um, we know that our efforts here have nothing to do with O'Hare Regional, the O'Hare Airport. Nothing at all. The FAA, as Representative DeLuca has indicated, has told us over and over again that in this area, we have the need and we have the capacity where we can have three major airports coexist in this region. And the fact that the governor would come and say, hey, airport, but don't mess with O'Hare, <laughs> is a problem, to be quite honest with you. And, and, and I feel like I've got the tenure uh, to be able to say that. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to saying that to his face at some point. That, you know, when it comes to this airport, a lot of us in this room have hinged our careers, our lives, whatever you want to call it, on the development of that project. Now, what can it bring to our region? If we extrapolate what we see in the O'Hare and Midway areas, if we extrapolate from that, then we know what that can do for our communities out here. That ancillary development outside of the airport footprint, uh, entrepreneurship, I mean, you name it. You know, it exists because of an airport like here. And unless somebody tells me otherwise, and I wouldn't dare say that I'm an expert uh, in airport, that uh, O'Hare can't go anymore, can't go any further. Midway can't, can't grow anymore. We need to be growing the third airport. It's plain and simple, straightforward, and all of the data suggests that that is indeed the case, that we need to do that. So while we're pleased at having uh, a step, and, and again, we appreciate the governor, we appreciate, again, Anthony and, and the Southland legislators are saying this is an important part, important step in us moving in that direction, but we know that the fact that we're still being compared to O'Hare still is a challenge for us, still is a, is a, is a challenge for us. 
But did we have, again, success out of the capital bill? Absolutely. Members were given the opportunity to share capital dollars, um, cut whatever deals they wanted to to try to help different communities. Um, I was in a conversation with many mayors who are examining, you know, the efforts of that, and some are happy, some are not happy, and, and I can appreciate that. But just know that the capital bill was about a six-year effort. Um, over a six-year period, and in my opinion, these things are ever evolving. So, not to say that, um, not to say that in year two we can get as much as we got in year one. But again, it's an ever-evolving plan. It's an ever-evolving project. So, I continue to would continue to stress you to talk to your legislators about other projects that maybe you'd like to see uh, moving forward from a capital perspective that you, that did happen in the beginning. Um, in terms of roads, we know that IDOT puts out a multi-year plan and they revise it every year. So there are yet still more opportunities to continue to get the types of projects in our communities that help foster the reason why we're here today, which is economic development. And, and, and I'll end by saying this, is that when we talk about economic development, at least to the extent in which I know and I understand it, um, we are talking about growth, we're talking about job opportunities, we're talking about you know, tax dollars into the communities that will allow them to be able to be uh, successful communities. One part of this conversation that I talk about a lot, um, maybe to some folks maybe more than I should, but I will continue to talk about, is local businesses. Because if we're talking about capital, we're talking about building things, infrastructure. Use your local businesses. Let's not have every business in Indiana coming over here and receiving resources and then going back to Indiana. Not opposed to it whenever the expertise um, is needed and that we don't have it here, but we have to start focusing on local businesses, businesses here in Illinois that are going to leave their tax dollars here in Illinois, and we also have to start talking about supply diversity. Have to start talking about it. Many of you know I advance legislation to always talk about the need to make sure that we are inclusion with regard to uh, African American, Latino, women, disabled owned businesses. They are an important part of this fabric as well. So, as we talk about those communities, we know that local businesses hire local people. You know, they will hire local people. And these are the folks in our communities that we want to see working. So, when you think about this development moving <coughs> forward, Let's think about how we can increase the opportunities for our local businesses as well. They're small in many cases, so maybe their capacity isn't as such, and you have to bring in larger businesses sometimes, and they may have to come in from out of state. We understand that, but those local small businesses, and I believe some of them are even represented in this room today, we have to give them an opportunity to, to work, to grow, to sustain themselves, and, and, and to uh, feed their families like we want for for any other business. So I will always continue to be an advocate for supplier diversity um, because I think it's an important part of who we are as a Southland. Because again, when we talk about the Southland, we talk about a room like this that has all of these different sectors in it, black, Latino, women. We know we talk about that. That's an important part of who we feel we are as the Southland. So let's not negate that when the money starts flowing and we're happy because we can start spending this money in projects. Let's not forget about the fabric of who we are in doing so and making sure that we are inclusive of organizations and businesses in our, in our region and, and, and that represent the, the diversity that we tout as being the Southland. So while, again, while we appreciate the success we had, we know that this is an ongoing effort and that year one does not define all that we can do in a capital bill. There will be other iterations of this capital bill. There will be other opportunities. I, I'm, I'm certain that in the fall we will be running trailer bill language to refine and to shape even further how this capital bill plays out. Talk to your legislators about those things that you'd like to see happen, those things that you think we missed the first time. That's an important part of this discussion is working with your legislators, those of us who will be down there in the trenches in the governor's office, in the deputy governor's office, in IDOT's office, wherever it is, DCEO had a great meeting with the new director of DCEO yesterday to start that relationship and that dialogue. So again, utilize your legislators, talk to them, share with them uh, what you feel is missing, what's needed. I'm happy to see Christian Perry, who's representing uh, Commissioner Donna Miller's office in the room today. She is a part of this conversation as well, and we should not leave 
our county elected officials out of this dialogue as well. So that being said, pleased and honored to be here. Apologize if I went a little bit longer than the five minutes Reggie told me I had. Um, and I felt a little underwhelmed because Anthony walked in with a folder and I'm like, yeah. so, so I picked up a couple of pieces of paper off the table there so I had something in my hand. But again, I, I'm proud of our Southland legislators, the way that we understand our issues, the way that we work collaboratively together, uh, trying to move these things forward. We all participate on a variety of task force groups that we welcome the opportunity to be on. Uh, one that I'm participating on, and I know Debbie is, I'm not, I'm not sure about Anthony, we have a property tax task force um, coming up that uh, many of us are participating on. And, and the reason that I bring that up, and I apologize, Rick, and I will close on that, is because while the conversation seemed to have been driven by our colleagues in Lake County, what we do know and understand is that our property tax issues are different than theirs. Theirs is because they tax themselves because they want all these great things and they've supported that. So they're just looking for reductions in their property taxes. Our property tax challenges is that because we don't have all of the business development, we don't have all of those resources, we tax ourselves because we're just trying to get to wherever they are. And we know that our conversation on property taxes is a hell of a lot different than their conversation on property taxes. So I'm happy that we are represented in that conversation to make sure that our issues out here in the South are uh, brought forward in that conversation as well. So again, your legislators are working on your behalf. You know, we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we are engaged in those conversations, positioning ourselves as leaders and chairing uh, appropriate committees to make sure that we give you a platform to talk about and, and to share your, your challenges and your issues and how we in the state of Illinois in the General Assembly can work to fix and to, uh, to, to change the dynamics in those narratives. So again, thank you all very much for allowing me to be here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Let's give all of our legislators a round of applause. Regionally, we are very fortunate to have the uh, representation that we do in Springfield. We're, we're fortunate in that our representatives came uh, from local government before they uh, decided to support us in Springfield. Uh, both Representative DeLuca and Representative Debbie Myers Martin are former mayors, former local mayors. Uh, Leader Davis uh, served locally on uh, congressional staff. And why that is such a, uh, a big advantage for us as mayors and local leaders is we don't, we don't have to explain the challenges to them. Uh, walking in the door for a meeting, they get it. Uh, this uh, year in Springfield, I believe up to a third of the legislators were brand new. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve on the Illinois Municipal League Board of Directors and one of their tasks this year was to, to educate the uh, new legislators, many of them had no background in local government at all, on the issues and challenges we had. So I just want to mention that, that we are extremely fortunate uh, to have legislators that have a background in local government. Uh, at this time, I would like to call the mayor of our host community, Mayor uh, Joseph Rudez, to the podium. Uh, mayor Rudez has uh, served as the mayor of University Park since uh, mid-May, has been a village resident since 1991. <clears throat> he is a United States Army veteran, a former president of ASME 3837, Council 31, former football coach, and served as a village trustee from 2005 to 2017. While trustee, he was the chairman of the National Organization of Democratic municipal officials. The mayor is also an ordained deacon at his family church, St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church in Chicago. He has been married to his wife Linda for over 30 years, and they are the proud parents of four children and the grandparents of seven. Oh Please join me in welcoming Mayor Joseph Rudez. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Governor State University. I'd like to first start off by recognizing some of my trustee members, Trustee Liz Williams, 
Trustee Sonia Jenkins, and Trustee Shirley Bogan. Good morning and welcome to Governor State University and University Park. I want to thank the Chicago Southland Economic Development Corporation for hosting this event at the beautiful Governor State University. Before I get into my remarks, let me say a few words about the water crisis facing my residents. There has been a lot of news about our village since mid-June. What has happened here is truly unfortunate. My administration has been working every day with the Illinois Environmental Protection and US EPA regulatory agents to rectify the situation. On behalf of my residents, which includes myself, since my home is on the Do Not Consume Advisory, we want to thank all the surrounding mayors and their residents, businesses in the region, faith-based and community groups for their support, donations, and assistance during this crisis. I was sworn in on May 14th, and a month later, we learned that there was lead in the water in some homes. Earlier this week, we had an Amtrak derailment, which included a fatality and injuries. It's been a busy three months on the job, just about 80 days. <laughs> I believe in the power of prayer, so I would ask each of you to pray for our community and the family members of the individual who lost his life in, a, in this derailment. Thank you. Now, I want to turn to economic development and give you the top five reasons why you should invest in University Park. Number one, I guarantee all of you that in the very near future, we will have the best tasting and most lead-free water in all the South Side. <laughs> Number two, we have wonderful and challenging University Park Golf Club for those executives who want to do business and get in a round of golf. Number three, if fishing is more your sport, we have Pine Lake. This is 10 acres encompassing two beautiful bodies of water with spectacular views. We are stocked with channel catfish and largemouth bass. Fishing permits are required. It's perfect for your next corporate outing. Number four, we have Governor State University, a fine institution to educate your workforce or host a company event. Number five, we have incredible economic development opportunities. We have land available, including underdeveloped properties in the village. We have industrial space in our Governor's Gateway Industrial Park, which has roughly 75 companies, but there's always room for more. We have retail space in our town center, including 35,000 square feet available immediately. And finally, as many of you know, University Park is home to many high-tech firms, including Bemba, Applied Systems, and Federal Signal. So see me after the event if you have any interest in doing business in our <coughs> village. While I'm here to promote University Park and the great things we do, I must also stress that University Park is a part of the Southland, and building a stronger Southland is a goal we all share. Following in the footsteps of my predecessors, University Park looks forward to continue to work with our neighboring communities, and particularly our neighbor to the south, Moni. Together, in recent years, University Park and Moni have quickly emerged as a national mega cluster for logistics, distribution, and e-commerce. Thanks to the proximity to several <coughs> interstate highways and national railroads, University Park is connected to by trucks and trains to both oceans, Canada, and the Gulf of Mexico. The Interstate 57 Logistics Corridor is booming and is considered one of the state's untold success stories. Anyone who drove here today along I-57, whether you came from the north or the south, witnessed for themselves the giant new distribution and fulfillment centers that have popped up in recent years. Big names such as Clorox, Georgia Pacific, Dot Foods, Avatar, and Amazon are ones you may recognize, just to name a few. And many more I-57 distribution centers are under roof or soon to be, including being built on spec, occupying literally millions of square feet. These new outlets employ thousands of new workers, many of whom are integrated with state-of-the-art robots and together they connect commerce to people across the Midwest and beyond. <clears throat> I'm excited to say 
This Boeing intermodal cluster is about to get even bigger. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> the new South Suburban Airport will complete a world-class transportation matrix <coughs> that boasts some of our nation's most expansive infrastructure hubs for trucks, trains, barges, and planes, which when completed will give the Southland new unprecedented non-stop connectivity to almost any other marketplace on the planet. We will suddenly transform the Southland into a necessary global distribution center hub. As you know, University Park has been a leading advocate of the South Suburban Airport for more than a decade. As a charter member of the Abraham Lincoln National Airport Commission, the village was a forceful voice in pushing the state and IDOT to acquire land for the airport and to seek innovative financing for the project through a public-private partnership. The effort was championed by former Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr. and former University Park Mayor Al McCowan. A third airport is important to Illinois' economic <coughs> future, but it's also the key to University Park's destiny. That's because University Park, as a village, would be a top frontline beneficiary of the airport. While we expect most of its customers will be heading to Chicago or places north, that's okay, because that means University Park will be the first village they drive through after arriving, and University Park will be the last village they drive through when departing. In other words, geographically speaking, University Park will be similarly situated to South Suburban Airport as Rosemont has been to O'Hare. Now think about it for a minute. Talk about transformational development. Airports create more jobs than any other investment over time. And we are talking jobs that run, from the, run the gamut for all of us, from hospitality to corporate CEOs and everything in between. As a region, we must stay united in this effort to transform the Southland. In closing, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. And for more information on our village, please visit our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Rudens. Uh, one thing I want to just make note of, the mayor mentioned in his presentation uh, the fact that there were spec buildings very, very large spec buildings being built in University Park, and we're also seeing that throughout the region. What's uh, very important and noteworthy about that is, is the signal that it sends. There are investors and developers willing to make significant investment in building these structures, and they don't even have a tenant yet. So I think it's an extremely positive sign for not only University Park, but also for the region uh, that we are becoming a magnet for things like the logistics centers and those types of things. So thank you, Mayor. We appreciate that. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jun Zhao. Uh, Dr. Zhao has been actively engaged in many service activities here at Governor State University and her professional community. She, she has served on, fac on the Faculty Senate, the Graduate Council Faculty Development Steering Committee, University Honors Program Council, the Global Affairs Council, as well as the Carnegie Classification Task Force in recent years. As Dean of the COB since November 2016, she has led the college's effort to enhance its engagement with its various stakeholders, including business partners. She will speak today about GSU's plan to establish a supply chain innovation center and business incubator as the Illinois Innovation Network Hub to provide consulting and training services to the business region. Please join me in, in welcoming back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Dean of the College of Business at Governor State University, I want to again welcome everyone to our beautiful campus on this uh, Friday morning. Um, and also, I want to thank um, all the state legislators who are here and local and regional leaders for your uh, hard work uh, to move the Southland forward. Um, it is so important um, to have that support and um, to uh, really um, promote the de uh, economic development in this region. So what I'm going to talk about today is our plan um, to be a part of that, um, because as the only 
four-year state university in the Southland, uh, Governor State University has a mission to be the region's economic catalyst. So our newest plan is to uh, establish a supply chain innovation center and business incubator and uh, use that as a, a mechanism to drive innovation and economic development in this wonderful uh, region of uh, Chicago South Bay. How many of you have heard of the IIN, Illinois Innovation Network? Some. How many of you have heard the Discovery Partner Institute, the BPI? So um, this is a new uh, program um, uh, introduced uh, by the state, and it's led by the University of Illinois system. Uh, from their, uh, through their uh, Vice President of Economic Development and Innovation, BPEDI. So they have led this system of connected university, community, industry-based hubs throughout the state that will work together uh, to drive innovation, economic development, and workforce development. So those are three major goals of this system. Um, currently, there are 15 hubs. Um, and throughout the state, and each of the 12 uh, public universities in the state has a hub. Uh, so this is, you can think that as a consortium of um, state universities and few other um, uh, institutions throughout the state. Um, and the focus of each hub is based on the region's need. So what they serve and what are the emerging needs of the region they serve. And also tied to the academic strength of the host university. So um, in this uh, FY20 budget uh, that was just passed uh, in June, uh, there was a $500 million um, appropriated from the Build Illinois Bond Fund to the Capital Development Board to uh, provide funds for this uh, system. Of course, the majority of that fund will go to the DPI, which is it's a site um, that University of Illinois is building in Chicago downtown. Some of you might have heard the plans, so the uh, join. Um, so that will serve, some would think, uh, as UI's um, Chicago um, uh, site. And University of Illinois Chicago, uh, their hub will focus on drug discovery, data science, entrepreneurship. Chicago State uh, University's plan was to establish a center for solution to urban populations. So as you can see, each hub has uh, a you know, unique focus that will address the needs and demands of the region they serve. So GSU uh, has chose to focus on supply chain and logistics sector um, as it's uh, the focus of its hub. This is because, as the mayor mentioned in his speech, this region has emerged as a uh, logistic and supply chain distribution hub. Um, so this is an area of growth for our uh, Southland and realizing that um, and building on our academic strength in our college and our university uh, and our partnership with many uh, public and private uh, uh, organizations uh, in this region, we decided to um, apply for this grant um, to establish a center uh, for global uh, uh, supply chain innovation center and business incubator. So we expect to receive about $400,000 from this grant uh, through the Capital Development Board. Um, and we don't have all the details yet, but uh, we do expect that funds to be available uh, sometime this fall. And we'll utilize that fund to renovate a vacant building on campus uh, to make it a space for the uh, Innovation Center and Incubator. So what we'll do is to provide uh, consulting services, training uh, to businesses in the sector and related sectors. Uh, we'll of course utilize our faculty expertise in both our college and other colleges in this university. Um, uh, provide employee training, management development programs, um, faculty consulting for technology and business solutions. As you know, some of you are in the, sec uh, in the logistics sector. There are a lot of technology changes. Um, smart logistics, auto, uh, auto, you know, uh, uh, semi-automatic vehicles, um, and blockchain technology. And also there's a lot of changes in the global environment that are driving um, you know, innovation in this sector. So we will work with businesses to help them, um, you know, solve this problem, come up with, um, you know, uh, uh, solutions. Uh, we will also provide professional certificate training program in supply chain management, 
And part of this space will also be a collaborative space uh, for entrepreneurs and startup businesses to develop their innovative ideas with support of mentors and consultants um, throughout our university and our network. So it's a big plan, but we cannot do it uh, alone. We need partners and we are building um, uh, on our existing partnerships with some of those organizations, some of them are here in this room. So we work very closely with Will County CED, uh, Chicago Southland Economic Development uh, Corporation, and there's a new consortium um, formed called the Will South, Con uh, South Coast TPL Employer Partnership, and we're part of that, and the uh, South Suburban um, Economic Growth Initiative, Prairie State College, uh, who will speak next, uh, SCORE, um, and OAI, and also Council for Supply Chain Management Professionals. So we have a lot of existing partnership with those organizations that will help us um, you know, provide services that we plan to um, uh, give to uh, businesses in this area. We also have partnership with um, businesses in this sector, so we will work with them to identify problems that small, medium, large corporations in this region may face, and so we will, um, you know, again, that's part of the innovation that we will um, uh, be focusing on. So our tentative timeline is pending on the, uh, you know, distribution of the fund. Uh, we will uh, renovate the space, make it ready, hopefully by early 2020, and in the meantime, we'll be working with uh, our partners to develop a, a you know, tentative plan uh, for the center and incubator. And we need, and we'll also continue to uh, seek funding because this fund only uh, is for capital. Uh, so it's only for the building. We still need funds, grants to um, uh, help us support the operational services. So um, we need your support, we need your participation. If you have any questions, ideas, comments, please uh, feel free to contact me and my uh, division chair, Dr. Ori Josie, uh, who's uh, stand uh, in the back. So uh, we're very excited about this new uh, uh, program, and uh, we look forward to working with many of you to make it a, a really great player uh, in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Our next presenter is Mr. Craig Schmidt. Uh, Craig is the Vice President of Community and Economic Development at Prairie State College. He will speak today to recent uh, developments in workforce training at Prairie State College, specifically the Department of Labor approved apprenticeship program uh, on campus and grant awards that support apprenticeship programs. He will also provide an update on the Mobile Training Center scheduled to arrive on the campus this summer. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Schmidt. Thank you, Dr. Joe. to Prairie State, and at the same time, if they sign up for Governor State, their tuition is frozen for Governor State. Um, so when they transfer, they finish their associate's degree at Prairie State, they'll transfer to Governor State. And from what I understand from our counselors, Governor State is the best and easiest university to work with, because we do work with several, but they're the, the best. And the other good thing about what I found out is the average GPA, we've got almost 200 individuals go through this program, the average GPA for them is 3.53. That means we are developing some, keeping, developing, keeping um, great talent within the, the Southland region. So again, congratulations to your anniversary. All right, now, what's happening at uh, Prairie State? Oh, there we go. All right, uh, Prairie State College, we're a uh, two-year comprehensive community college uh, located in, in Chicago Heights, um, granting degrees and certificates in nearly 100 uh, uh, fields um, in uh, industry, in the industry. 
We, uh, we serve about 10,000 students annually. Our district goes up from about 175th Street down to the Will, um, the Will uh, Kankakee County line, over to Harlem, and then over to the um, uh, Indiana border. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you quickly about is some initiatives, uh, workforce initiatives that are happening at the college. Uh, <clears throat> Apprenticeship programs, that is our, uh, the, the, the buzzword of the, of the year, right? Now, there is a lot of money that is coming down from, the, uh, the, from President Trump down to the, uh, to the state level for apprenticeship programs. Some grant dollars, we have received some, so which is exciting. So we, what is Prairie State College have? We have three right now. We have a commercial driver's uh, <clears throat> a CDL license program. We have industrial maintenance mechanic, as well as now, most recently, information technology, networking administrator. So quickly, the uh, CDL program is a commercial driver's license. It's a 12-month program. When they, upon completion, they earn their CDL, CDL as well as the uh, recognized, nationally recognized credential with the Department of Labor. So if there are any trucking companies in the audience that would like to talk about how we can develop a pipeline of truck drivers for you, see me afterwards. All right, our second is the Industrial Maintenance Mechanic Apprenticeship Program. We've heard from the industry that, you know, while there is a need for operators, there is also a need for technicians. Technicians to keep the machines running, keep them in production and online, right? Um, and so, well, we developed this program, and what it's, moving, what it's doing is moving operators into the technician slash mechanic field. Uh, one of the things that we're doing now is the companies we're working with is mostly focused on incumbent working workers, their, their current workforce, um, upskilling them to, to that next level. And so this program here is a three-year program. It's uh, earning 47 credits, earning a certificate in maintenance mechanic, as well as the Department of Labor recognized credential. Now, while this program can be used as an onboarding tool for, for manufacturing companies, we've been mostly focused on the upskilling of their current workforce. Okay, which also means that these individuals are working full time and going to school part time, right? So, and many of these individuals may not have um, been in school in a long time. So, we have developed a pre-apprenticeship training that would help them prepare to be successful in the apprenticeship program. It's a basic math. It's a blueprint reading and a, and a uh, tools for the trade uh, from class. <clears throat> the third is our, our most recent is our networking. <coughs> the IT Networking Administrator Apprenticeship Program. Again, it's a three-year program, but individuals, individuals with this will go to school full-time and work part-time, and hopefully work full-time during the summer and on, and on breaks. Uh, when they finish this, they will have, actually have an associate's degree in IT networking, four Cisco networking certificates, as well as the nationally recognized certificate from the Department of Labor. Now, we actually have a grant for this program, so that the tuition is currently paid, but we are looking for employers to take on an IT apprentice. And you don't have to be an IT company, but most of you have IT departments, right? So if you're looking at um, expanding your workforce or finding a way to increase your talent pipeline, I have individuals who, are, who have started classes and are ready to start employment right now. So if you're interested in um, creating that talent pipeline, please talk to me. Now while we also have these programs, they don't have to just be in these industries. An apprenticeship program can be in any industry. So if you're looking for a way um, to invest in your workforce and in your employees, meaning that you have the opportunity to develop loyal and qualified individuals for your company. All right. So this is what the apprenticeship programs are, are about. It's like building your, your own workforce, okay, because they're, they're you know, you've seen the trades, you've seen a number of other companies have their programs. These are Prairie State's programs, meaning we're the owner, we're the sponsor of the programs. We take all the work off of you and we do that. So all the paperwork, we work with the apprentice, make sure that they're successful in the classroom as well as on the job. Employer responsibilities, what does it mean? Hire an apprentice and pay a wage. Pay the cost of the apprenticeship program. Right now, right now, the IT apprenticeship program is paid for by a grant, so it'll help you save some costs there. Uh, <clears throat> you need a private mentor, which is usually the supervisor, as well as the time for the apprentice to uh, attend class. Prairie State will take care of the classroom instruction, any tutoring, all the paperwork to the Department of Labor, as well as meet regularly with the apprentice and the employer to ensure that they are successful <coughs> on the job and in the classroom. 
All right, so apprenticeships, again, if you want to talk to me about them, happy to do so. But I also want to talk about the save the date, September 17th. What does that mean? That means that our mobile training centers, if you haven't heard about them yet, are arriving on our campus within the next month. We will, September 17th will be the launch celebration date for these mobile training centers, right? So what are these? Three, two 53-foot semi-trailers. One outfitted with eight welding stations and two simulators. The other with CNC, electricity, robotic, and 3D printing equipment to take to company sites to do training on sites. They're all encompassing uh, classroom and hands-on training, temperature controlled, Wi-Fi enabled, ADA compliant, everything right there that you need to do the training. This will help individuals, because we could be training during, before shift, during shift, after shift. This prevents individuals from getting off work, then going home, and then having to drive to the college for classes, you know, especially if they live in Indiana or South or, or even near Chicago. Uh, so it's just a very exciting. Uh, this are the, you're actually seeing first pictures of, of these. The, the one on the left is the actual uh, CNC robotic and electricity trailer training center. And then the, on the right is the inside of it. You can see they're very shiny. And uh, on the left there you can see cabinets. On the right will be the equipment. So they haven't installed that equipment yet. That's being done soon. Um, and then, not, you know, we're not going to leave them all you know, the white, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, they're branded Prairie State College. And so you're going to get the first look at what they're going to look like, all right? This has not been uh, shared yet. So you can kind of see that. If you, the, you see the wheels on the far right there at the bottom, and then on the far left here is where they hook up to the semi tractor. Does that make sense? The white squares or boxes are compartments, uh, storage. Uh, <clears throat> and so, anyway. Like I said, these training centers, they will be um, in full operation October 1st. We are currently meeting with companies and, and scheduling trainings now. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, please see me after this, or Jim Kivaderis, is it? Jim, raise your hand. He's uh, also on our team. Uh, so see one of us, and we can talk to you about outlining any, uh, any training programs. But now we did receive a grant from the Economic Development Authority to pay this covering 50% of the cost of these uh, mobile training centers. So we are looking for sponsorships uh, <clears throat> to help the college cover the rest of its costs. <clears throat> um, so if workforce development is part of your company's mission and you would like to see your company name, you know, on these traders that are going to be in the Chicago Southland and beyond here, let us know. We can talk to me or Jeff Cohen is in the audience. Jeff, raise your hand. Jeff? Oh, there he is. So he is also on our team to help us um, get those sponsorships. Anyway, a lot of great, exciting things that are taking place here at the college. Um, there's a contact, so just let us know. And um, one thing I do want to, I want to be remiss is I do want to thank the Honorable um, Debbie Myers Martin, Will Davis, Thaddeus Jones, Marcus Evans for securing a bill for $20 million to support work workforce equity initiative. Um, it is to serve underrepresented, um, underrepresented minority and socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals and linking them to the workforce, the skills gap. Whatever the gaps is, we're to work, um, get those two to, together. So it's $20 million for the community colleges, it's about 1.7 for each for Prairie State, as well as South Suburban College, and I sincerely thank you for all your efforts. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Our next and final speaker is Cecilia Diaz. She is a planner with the Cook County Department of Transportation. So good morning, everyone. My name is Cecilia Diaz, as I've been introduced by the gentleman here. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I want to acknowledge some of the mayors that, um, that I'm going to be uh, discussing for the community in this area. Um, as he mentioned, I am a transportation planner. Uh, I've been with the county for less than a year. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor. Just show of hands, how many people have heard of the Logistic Corridor? All right. Some of you guys don't count because you guys were working with us. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, what's unique about this corridor is that it's located within three communities, the Chicago Heights, Sock Village, and uh, the Ford Heights 
And this is an unusual space in Cook County because it has large underutilized sites adjacent to near highway or rail lines and available for development. So with a long history of industrial character, Cook County took a, 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 a study uh, granted by the IDOT funding to find out why uh, there were obstacles to redevelop in these sites, given the competitive advantages. I will, lay the lay, I will lay out the plan's key findings and potential for redevelopment, which will then contribute to the Southland economy, as we've all been talking about. So I'm going to orient you to the map. Uh, this is a map that includes Fort Heights, a little bit of Linwood, Chicago Heights, and uh, to the South Sock Village. Uh, if you look a little closer, you're going to see that the Union Pacific Railroad traverses from north to south on the western part of that map. And you will see that uh, the Canadian National cuts across right in the middle. All right, now those are the rail lines. But what else do you see? You see that the Joe, uh, the Joe Orr Road is to the north, and to the south would be the trail, uh, Sauk Trail Village. Right in the center would be Route 30, all right? So a lot of you, are familiar with this space, but uh, may not be familiar with what we've been doing. The study identifies 21 sites within the designated corridor as having the greatest potential for redevelopment. Sites were evaluated using many criteria, but these are some of the key components. Environmental risk, parcel size and ownership, transportation access, shovel readiness, property tax rate, zone and land use, utility uh, cost. This detailed analysis shows that 13 sites had strong development potential. Eight of those were dropped. Why? Because of environmental risk, interest by forest preserve for acquisition, wetland or plain, uh, floodplain concerns. So what does that take us? We now see a different perspective. We have a priority sites now. These are things that have been sifted up as a result of those criteria. You will see that the top six priority <laughs> sites are highlighted with solid lines, and four secondary tier sites are with hash lines. The green lines and the red lines simply indicate that there's rail access to those sites, and the yellow represents no access to the rail sites. But don't be dismissive of that. That means that it's just closer to the highways. Our back of the envelope estimates about $11 million for site preparation costs. What does that entail? It, costs, it talks about the extension of utility service, storm water retention, environmental ass assessments and remediation, and, uh, and clearing. All reasonable across the corridor particularly given that they would be shared between public and private sectors. So what have we do, been doing to push this forward? We recognize that implementation efforts will involve close coordination across Cook County agencies. As a matter of fact, I'm joined here by Mohammed from uh, BED and also Jessica <coughs> from uh, Sustainment and Environmental. The three municipalities that I have mentioned, and SSMMA and CSEDC. Since the publication of that strategic plan, the partners have made significant progress across multiple dimensions, and I will color, uh, cover those in the brief uh, slides. The property tax analysis has been conducted by Cook County that showed that property tax, tax rates are the single biggest obstacle to the redevelopment of this priority sites. You already know that, we've already discussed that. Cook County has partnered with SSMMA to advocate for property tax relief legislation in Springfield. This legislation will make tax rates on these properties competitive with other industrial areas in Cook County, in Will County, and even in Northwest Indiana. While we were unsuccessful to pass a bill in the spring session of the General Assembly, property tax relief will continue to be pursued. 
The Department of Environmental and Sustainability has received numerous grants, and I will discuss that at a later slide. The Department of Planning and Development was awarded the Community Development Block Grant funds for a comprehensive assessment of Fort Heights infrastructure. Also, the Department of Transportation and Highways awarded a $350,000 of Invest in Cook 2018 grant for Phase 1 engineering of road and rail extension in the Sauk Village Logistics Center. And the department is also about to produce an estimate of the cost of water, sanitation, and storm sewer extension to the two developments that are located east of I-394. So let me talk to you a little bit about the marketing brochure. Um, we have a couple of examples of what this looks like. It's a comprehensive uh, information about the sites. It refers, we call it now the Metro Chicago Lincoln Highway Industrial Corridor uh, to give a broader casting of net, if you will. It was to highlight the nine priority sites and to provide individual site speculations. This brochure has been distributed to county and its partners to get the word out that these sites are available and we are presenting them to uh, industries such as this one. And we did also some, uh, send it to uh, Select USA. So let me talk a little bit about that Brownfield Grants. In addition, Cook County Department of Environmental and Sustainability received the largest Brownfield Assessment and Remediation Grant made by the US EPA in 2018. It received $600,000 for environmental assessment for Phase 1 and Phase 2 in the Lincoln uh, just Logistic Corridor. It also received $750,000 of revolving loan funds for remediation in both Lincoln Highway Logistic Corridor sites and West Suburb Cook County. The Lincoln Highway Priority Development sites will be among the first candidates for assessment under this U.S. EPA grant. Also, the Bureau of Environment of Economic Development has various low interest tools such as built and cook loan program, private activity bonds, and enterprise industrial growth opportunity zones that can be layered together to help businesses. This could be used to buy land, buildings, rehab or build new structures, and or purchase machinery and equipment with the objective of ensuring that new development can be penciled out. As we look ahead, frequent and close coordination is critical to achieving the corridor's full potential. Ongoing initiatives continue. Cook County staff is on call to deploy with our existing resources as needed to meet development opportunities. Through this process, we've developed new lines of communication across the agencies and government, which positions us to adapt to any changes in the landscape. We would like to deepen our understanding of the needs of the local businesses and intend to reach out to existing industrial stakeholder groups such as this one. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me or my colleagues. Raise your hands, my colleagues. Awesome, great, thank you. And, um, and we'd be happy to help you talk about that. If you have any other further questions, we also have our points of contact if you want to take a picture. And um, we thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity and we look forward to continuing to work here at, at, uh, at the Southland. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Reggie would like to present closing remarks. Thank you. Years ago, or four years ago, we started something called the Big Shoes Report. 
The Big Shoes Award was to recognize the really one, one of the contributors to our local economy, the key figure, Jack Langan Sr., who started a company called My Jack Products. Many of you knew Jack. He was a major figure out here and really contributed to the success of our region in a substantial way. Many of you know, may know he passed away last year, which is a, you know, sad, a sad event. But of course, his children and grandchildren continued the tradition of this great company. So they uh, allowed us, or we worked together with them, and we changed now our Big Shoe Award to the Big Shoe Jack Lanigan Senior Memorial Award, which I think uh, in, indicates uh, their, their feeling that we're doing good stuff that can help carry on the tradition of Jack who was really quite the character. So our, our next award is coming up. We changed the date some to begin for sort of the kickoff of the 2019-2020 uh, economic development program. Uh, we have a folder here or a brochure about it you may have picked up on the way in. So I'd really like to encourage you to consider sponsoring and coming to this event to support the work that CSDC does. Uh, particularly with the work we do with education with high schools, is a lot of that's used for. But I would uh, also, the winner this year I'm happy to announce is Nancy Wilson, who's the CEO of a company called Morrison Container Handling Solutions, who's in Glenwood. A very technically sophisticated company, and Nancy has really been a leader in working with long-term education issues. She's become uh, a good friend of ours, and I'm really honored to be able to uh, announced that she's the award winner. It's also, I must say, nice to have uh, you know, a woman win. She's a great leader here. So we've had uh, Charlie Gallagher, Car Carter Sterling, uh, Ann Dewitt, and Jack Lanigan were the four previous winners. So the fifth anniversary is more than the name. So please consider coming. It's in, when is it, September 12th, I think. So we have time. I'd love to have you sign up as a sponsor. I think we already have 10 people. Uh, also, when the a fun event, I think many of you may have come. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very brief two hours, heavy hors d'oeuvres, uh, you know, have a drink and talk and network with friends. We have a brief program. Uh, President Preckwinkle has usually come in the past. I don't think she's confirmed yet she will be there. But many of those award winners will be there as well, too. The previous one, I know Charlie said he was coming. Carter said he was coming as well. So anyway, take that. Please consider uh, that as an investment in the region and the work we do. So again, thank you so much for coming, Rick. Yeah, any more things? Uh, just thank you. Thank, thank you. Just in closing, I wanted to acknowledge and thank all of our investors that make these quarterly forums uh, possible. Uh, we, we appreciate that in addition to the support that we get from all of our business leaders and municipal leaders. Uh, having said that, we will conclude, but I encourage you to stick around for a while, do a little networking, uh, um, and then enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Thank you, and God bless.